Who killed Alicia Hummel? A question that has gone unanswered for six years. Alicia Marie Hummel was a 29-year-old teacher at Siouxland Family Center in Dakota City, Iowa, not far from Sioux City. She married her high school sweetheart, Tony Hummel, when she was in college in 2011. But in 2014, she and Tony separated, and as the summer of 2015 approach, she's coming to terms with her upcoming divorce and looking forward to the summer break from her job to help her clear her head and regroup. She decided to start her summer break with a fishing trip to Mayron Grove, South Dakota, just up the Missouri River from Sioux City, where the Missouri defines the border between South Dakota and Nebraska. She invited friends to come, but when no one was available, decided to make the trip alone. According to her family, she was a fearless adventurer who enjoyed the outdoors. So on Monday, June 1st, 2015, Alicia announced on Facebook, first day of vacay, I'm going fishing. During her trip, she stopped at Walmart and posted regular updates to her Snapchat account saying, finally, I've been waiting since fall. She posted a photo of her arrival at Mayron Grove and at 1.45 p.m. in the afternoon, text a friend to tell them she'd seen a couple making love along the river, joking that it's a great day to get it on. It was the last text Alicia Hummel ever sent. Just over an hour later, around 3 p.m., a state worker who was in the area picking up trash found Alicia's body in the water near the boat ramp. She'd suffered blunt force trauma to her head and been slashed across the throat. An autopsy would later determine that Alicia had drowned. The toxicology report stated that she had no alcohol or drugs in her system. No other evidence was found, but a worker and a nearby resident both stated they saw a dark colored car with tinted windows and a loud exhaust system leaving the area around the time that Alicia was murdered. Alicia's fishing pole and cell phone were never found, but one year after the murder, her purse was found on a sandbar along the river. Its contents intact, including cash in her wallet, suggesting to the police that robbery was not a motive in Alicia's murder. When a married woman is murdered, her husband is investigated as an obvious possible suspect, but Tony Hummel had an alibi. Several witnesses confirmed that at the time of the murder, he was over 250 miles away in Pierre, South Dakota. To this day, investigators continue to be frustrated by the lack of evidence in the case. To this day, investigators continue to be frustrated by the lack of evidence in the case. They have not released Alicia's autopsy report to her family, as it may contain evidence that could someday help them to identify her killer or killers. Clay County Sheriff Andy Howe was reported in the press as stating that one of the murder weapons has been identified, but the information has also been withheld. Police told Alicia's family and friends that she has not been sexually assaulted, saying that her killer or killers wouldn't have the sufficient time to commit such an assault. At Alicia's funeral, friends and family members noticed what appeared to be a broken finger on one of her hands, suggesting that Alicia may have put up a struggle and it's possible that DNA evidence was found, but has not yet been linked to a suspect. In 2018, Sheriff Howe told the press that there were no suspects, but in 2021, he stated, we do have suspects, but we don't have a case, suggesting that some progress has been made in the investigation. He also suggested that police have identified the weapon used to create the blunt force trauma Alicia suffered, but not the weapon that slashed her throat. Sheriff Howe added that the FBI has been consulted and that the violent nature of the murder suggests that the killer or killers were unknown to Alicia and that this was a crime of opportunity. No one has come forward to say that they were in the area on that day, even though Marion Grove is normally a busy area for locals in June. Only one road leads in or out of the boat ramp area. View in the summer months, making the area very secluded. However, it is still open and accessible to the general public at all times and is not regularly staffed. How is it that no one saw what happened to Alicia? Alicia's best friend, Bethany Svacina, has championed the pursuit of justice for Alicia since that terrible day. Alicia's family have supported her tireless effort to find out who killed Alicia and why. 
A Facebook page called Fighting for Justice for Alicia Hummel keeps Alicia's case in the public eye. Bethany agreed to sit down for a Zoom interview with us and address the many questions raised by our investigation. I'm here with Bethany Svasina. Did I say that properly? You did. I got it right. Okay. Got, got it right. That. I imagine you've heard it mangled so many different ways. Um, and um, by this point in the show, everyone knows who you are and uh, why it's so important that we speak to you. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for taking time out to do this show. It's not only harvest season up where you are, but you've got children at home. So you're a busy person and I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us and make this information available to everybody in our show. Um, by now, everyone who's watching knows the basics. We've kind of covered that, um, but we do have more questions. It just seems like the more questions you get answered, you just get more questions in this case. And it's, I can only imagine how frustrating it is. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask was, um, did Alicia ever express to you um, or anyone else at the time, family, that, that anyone was bothering her, stalking her, harassing her, maybe a coworker at the school or anybody else that, that she was concerned about her own safety in any way? Nothing. Um, Nobody. You know, we don't have an, anything. I wish in a sense that we did, because maybe that would help us, you know, yeah. get answers. But no, right. it, you know, Alicia was becoming independent, finding herself. And so with that, you know, there's a whole, I mean, that opens up a lot, but no, nothing was ever yeah. said. Wow. Okay. I didn't think so, but since no one specifically addressed that uh, anywhere up till now that I've been able to find, I wanted to, to um, clear that. Um, as you said, she was gaining her independence. She was in the process of divorcing her husband, Tony, who she actually met through you. You've known Tony longer than, than Alicia did. Um, at the time, um, was okay, first of all, was Alicia seeing anyone else or talking about seeing anyone else? Or was she just trying to get the divorce done so she could start her own life? Uh, the best way to answer that would be it, were there people that in Alicia's life that were males? Yes. Would I say she was quote unquote seeing someone? No. Okay. Um, you know, she, there, there was someone that she hung out with. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it that it was anything official. Um, and, he, and that, um, person had been along, you know, since before Tony. So it, it wasn't anyone, you know, new, or anything, mm -hmm. and it was still within that same group. Lifelong friend kind of situation. Yeah, I mean, she had known him just as long since high school. Okay, um, just wondering. Um, what what did, uh, out of curiosity, no one's mentioned this, and I just like to get every obsessive little detail I can. What did Tony do for a career? What was his occupation? Uh, so Tony used um, to work for... Um, one of our meat manufacturers um, in Sioux City. And I would say within a year before, and I'm, I, I don't quote me exactly, but a, around a year before their divorce, he um, quit that job and went into working with his dad. And his dad has a house moving business. And so at the time of her death, he was working for his dad um, moving houses. Okay. Um, good to know. Um well, you, he had had a brief time of unemployment there. Alicia was working. Did they have financial troubles? Were they struggling or were they okay? I mean, Alicia always talked about, you know, money and, and not. And I wouldn't say that, um, you know, Alicia was tight with her money. Um, she was very frugal with her money. She spent, you know, if, if she wanted to go shopping, she did. And she had mm -hmm. a lot of things that maybe some people wouldn't say was necessity. Um, and did that cause problems in their marriage? Yes. Um, you know, with going to college, um, she had student loan debt, as mm -hmm. did he. Um, you know, medically, she had things that came up medically with her as well. Um, and so she had medical bills. Um, but when they were separated, it was almost as if they ran, and even when they were together, ran as two separate um, 
bank accounts, two separate people. You know, she had her bills, he had his bills, okay. and it wasn't a whole lot of moving in between. And so did it cause problems? Yes. Um, but, you know, up within that last six months to a year, they weren't really sharing money. You know, she would ask that he, you know, pays the electric bill or and does things so that she is able to stay in the home in Newcastle. And when that wasn't always being done, then she did, you know, eventually move home to her grandparents. Right. And it's That's hard it. when you're you're working in Dakota City, Nebraska, and you live in, you know, Newcastle. That is a jaunt. It is a drive. Mm -hmm. And Newcastle isn't a very big town. And so, you know, when you're trying to figure yourself out, it makes sense to go where you're comfortable to go home. Exactly. Yeah. And family support is crucial in a situation like that. So the house in Newcastle was the home that they shared when they were married. And then, as you said, Alicia moved back with her grandparents, with her family, and Correct. Tony stayed there at the house. No. No. What happened to the house in Newcastle? So, so Tony wasn't staying at the house in Newcastle. Tony was staying with his parents in Jefferson, South Dakota. Okay. So the, the house in Newcastle basically it was either Alicia living there or, or no one was living there. Um, and so, you know, when she moved out, then the, it was just the house in Newcastle. Okay. So at the time she was murdered, neither of them were living there, but they still owned the house. They hadn't sold it yet. It was probably part of the divorce proceedings, the financial stuff. Yeah. So with, so, so with the house moving business, that home was, you know, that was moved was a house that, that Tony's dad moved in and they put a basement in and they had the land there. So it, it was that family had that house. Um, okay. You know, and they were trying prior to the talk of splitting anything like that, they were going to try and renovate it. And there was things that they were going to do because it, it was an older home and there were things that needed to be done. It, it just, you know, the marriage kind of was up in shambles and none of that was getting done. Right. So it was just a house there. And, you know, they, I don't know the logistics of if the house was even talked about because at that point they weren't really getting anywhere, you know, doing mm -hmm. the divorce paperwork with that. It was merely a, a conversation like, okay, we, we're going to talk about this and I want to file papers and, and what that looks like. You know, he wanted it one way, she kind of wanted it another, and it was trying to come to a compromise without having attorneys involved. Um, and what that looked like. And she wanted to make sure, you know, she got what she did, what she felt she deserved. Right. Okay. So it was a little bit of a contentious split up. It wasn't very amicable in that way. No, no. no. Okay. I would say that she, I mean, when this all first started, she definitely wanted the marriage to work. She definitely wanted counseling. She wanted, you know, that this is the love of her life. You know, she doesn't mm -hmm. want to see the marriage end. Um, growing up Catholic and being Catholic, that's, you know, divorce is not a very good thing in the eyes of the church. And yeah. that was something she struggled a lot with. And we had conversations about, you know, what is, what is God going to think of me now because I'm divorced and I can't take communion and, and just the things that surrounded just being a, a, a woman or being Catholic. And then, mm -hmm. you know, now you're divorced and what does that look like? Um, so no, it, it definitely was not something she wanted um, at all. And then when she was finally like, okay, this isn't going to work, then it was like, okay, then I, I want out, you know, and I want to mm -hmm. be able to continue to live comfortably and getting out. I don't want to just be taken for a ride because, you know, I can be or because it's the easy way. Right. So Alicia was fighting for the marriage, but it sounds like Tony was not. It sounds like he was ready to move on. Is that accurate? I, I would say that was accurate. Yes. Okay. So what, just to, to clear it up, what was the breaking point for Alicia with her reaching the point where saying, g going from, I want to save the marriage. I want to make this work. We can, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this from a spiritual point of view. And to okay, I'm done. We're we're going to talk divorce now. This is it. I think when she realized that that the the other woman wasn't going anywhere, you know, as much as she wanted her to get out of his life and to go, it wasn't. She wasn't. And um, 
you know, there were still lies and things that were not working. She, I mean, she didn't feel valued and she realized that I'm better than that. And I, Mm -hmm. I deserve to be happy and finally coming to terms with it's okay. I deserve to be more happy. And, and a lot of, I think there's a lot of support in the people she did reach out to. Um, She reached out to a lot of people regarding um, where she was at with her, um, you know, feelings regarding Tony. Um, She would, kind of give people bits and pieces, um, but no one really ever got the full story just because that kept her safe. It mm-hmm. kept her, you know, it didn't make her as vulnerable, um, but she did give bits and pieces to people here and there and, and a lot of feedback coming to her. And finally, I think it was just that, you know what, I deserve better. And there is people out there that are willing to give me the time of day to right. say that I deserve better. Exactly. And you were her best friend. If she were going to confide in anyone, it would I would think it would be you. Um, there were lot, lots of talks and lots of tears. I will, I will admit to that. She did. Am I right uh, in recalling that she did literally catch Tony in the act of being unfaithful? I mean, she did, did, is it true that she walked in on him and his, his girlfriend? No, that is correct. Yes. I can't imagine what something like that is like. And then I don't want to get into sort of detail, but she walks in and catches them. And I'm sure is shocked and is reacting uh, in an upset way. How does Tony react? How does this other one react? Did she ever tell you anything of that? I. Yes, because I was the one that got called afterwards and she ended up at my house after it happened. But it didn't go well, I'll tell you that much. Um, that The woman didn't leave the bed and Tony didn't leave the bed. Alicia left. So it, it that, didn't go well at all. Another man who I, I have some trouble understanding is Sheriff Howe, um, to switch gears here. He said in 2018 that uh, there were no suspects. Um, and then this year on June 1st, the sixth anniversary, there was a television uh, segment up there um, discussing the case. And he said on the air that there were suspects, but no case. Um, he also intimated to the television interviewer um, that there was lots of evidence, his words, and that the police know what blunt instrument was used to cause the blunt force trauma to Alicia's head, um, but they don't know what what was used to cut her throat. Um, has, has and this is on, obviously an ongoing active case. The police have to withhold a lot of information just to clear false confessions and verify real uh, culprits. But has any more information than that been given to the family? Has, does the family know what kind of evidence the police have found or what, what that instrument was used or who these suspects or persons of interest might be? No, Nothing. and unfortunately we learned that there was suspects when we listened to that air on television. So the family knows as much as I do. As far Correct. As that goes and unfortunately, that that has been very true in all of this. Um, is that the family really doesn't know? And you know, we have a lot of people ask us questions, but we don't have answers. Are they still refusing to release the autopsy to the family? Correct, because from our understanding, it is an open investigation. Mm-hmm. He, he did say in that interview as well that there's no DNA evidence. Is that your understanding that there isn't DNA evidence? That's something they'd like to have, or do you even know that? No idea. Wow. No. Um, okay. Um, uh, taking another angle, uh, in the interview, Sheriff Howe said that this uh, they saw no indication that this was someone who was known to Alicia that her killer was probably a stranger and he called this uh, in his words, a crime of opportunity is what it appears to be by, uh, by their accounts. I and mean, they obviously know more than we do. So taking him at his word, um, is there any history of unsolved murders 
in that area that you're aware of or along that river, um, like a serial killer or someone who's done this before. I've been looking online and I haven't been able to find anything like that. Um, I would think if someone is a random murderer who's just taking primus of opportunity and picking victims when they can get them in a rural area, you've probably struck more than once. Even if Alicia was the first victim, it's been six years. Why wouldn't they have struck again, if especially being so successful with a broad daylight murder? Are there any other unsolved murders that fit this in any way? Uh, the only one that comes to mind is the murder of Tammy Haas. And that was you know, over 20 years ago. Um, right. And that ha happened up by Yankton. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, that one did go to court. And, you know, they didn't end up um, finding the person guilty, and so it still remains an unsolved murder. Yeah. Um, but that is the only one um, that I, you know, can come up with that's close to this area. That's Definitely nothing one. within the last six years. Yeah, that's the only one I found as well. And I can't imagine, I'm no psychologist or profiler, but from what little know, I do know in the research and reading I've done, and in talking to these people, it's it's unlikely that a serial killer would kill once and then go dormant for 14 years, um, whatever the amount of time was between those two. So I think it's safe to rule out the Tammy Haas case as being related um, just on, on general terms. So there's nothing else. A, a, a stranger saw a crime of opportunity in broad daylight, committed it in an astonishingly short amount of time, got away in broad daylight in a public area, and then decided, well, that's one and done. I'm never going to kill again. It, it To me, it casts a lot of doubt on the random serial killer um, theory. Um, one of the other theories that gets created around, especially when uh, Alicia made the, the text of, uh, something about, I guess it's a good day to get laid or something like that. She had caught two people in the act of having sex. And... Um, some people have speculated that, well, maybe this was someone cheating on their spouse or someone who didn't want to get caught or outed, uh, panicked, and maybe it attacked Alicia, or that she saw something else happen, a drug deal, uh, some other crime, something like that, and maybe recorded it with her phone since she was taking photos and, and doing texts and things, and that that's why she was killed, and that's why her phone's missing. Um, what do you think about that? theory that's out there. Do you think there's any weight to that? Um, I think there's a lot of theories out there and, and <clears throat> you know, I guess we all kind of want to figure it out and see what's right in our head. You know, I go through the same thing. Did, was it that these two people were having sex? Was it that, that she saw something she wasn't supposed to in the sense, was it consensual? Was it, you know, you know, did she, because she sent the text, did someone freak out? Because, you know, now she's not only just there to fish, she's not really minding her own business. And thus, I'm going to take it into my own hands. I, you know, I don't know. Was it a drug deal? Deal Was it drug related? Was someone high? And that's right. why they freaked the way they did. I, you know, I, I guess those are all, there's are all theories. And I don't know if, if we'll ever know why they did what they did. Or if it was more than one person or just one person, it just, it's really hard to believe that the two people she hot saw having sex didn't have anything to do with it if they haven't came forward. Because that text came very shortly prior to what her time of death reads. And her, her purse is found a year later on a sandbar with her, her cash in it, her wallet in it. Obviously, this wasn't a crime of, of, of theft gone wrong but not her cell phone. Do you know if the police ever sent divers into the river to look for their cell phone? Um, I'm, I, I geek out on pointless little trivia. I actually did some research. The world record for throwing a cell phone is about 300 feet. So, I mean, did they go out and, and obviously they, they searched the grounds, but if someone killed her and to get rid of evidence through her phone in the river, did they ever die of the river looking for the phone early on in the best investigation you know we were told that they um drug the river you know but it's a it's it's the missouri river it's it's a fast moving river yeah. you know it's 
I mean, it's a needle in a haystack throwing a phone and, and being able to come up with it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I know that they, they had stated early on that they had drugged the river, you know, and they had, they were doing what they could to see if they could find any evidence within the river. It's also not it, the clear, the clearest water in the world either. So no. finding a phone at the bottom of the riverbed might be uh, a little difficult. I just, that's one of the things that stood out to me is like, well, did they look in the water for the phone? Maybe someone threw it there. Um, getting back to Tony, um, Tony's alibi is described by the police as airtight. He was in pier at the time that Alicia was killed. In fact, um, Tony had contacted you, isn't that right? To ask you if you had heard from Alicia? Correct. Yeah. So Tony was, um, had, was to told me that he was contacted by the police to state that Alicia was missing, that they had found her car, but that she was missing. They had not found her. And if I had heard from her and I said, I hadn't heard from her. And he said, well, you're not with her. And he goes, you know, the, you're the closest person to her. You're not with her. And I said, I'm not with her. And from then on, I said, you know, I can call around. I can do what I, you know, try and get a hold of people to see if anyone else was with her. Um, you know, and he said, okay. And I said, well, keep me updated. And he's like, well, I'm on my way back. You know, they, they want me to come in. So I'm on my way back. And I said, okay, well, keep me updated. And so I actually, at that point in time, didn't even have my own cell phone. We were actually going to look at farm equipment um, about an hour away. And he got a hold of me through my husband's phone. So, I mean, he was pretty worried and in, worried enough to call me get a hold of me through my husband's phone for that to start moving. So early on, we were told, I mean, I was told, Tony, you know, Tony told me, and then, you know, um, Alicia's grandparents also were told that Alicia was missing. Um, that, and that came from, you know, the, the um, police that were on the scene, essentially. How... Okay, um, and that it, you, Tony called your husband's phone. It was what, about five, five thirty, somewhere around there. It was somewhere in, in that time frame. Yes. Okay, and Alicia was killed. She sent her last text about one forty-five. So the time of death is uh, established, but somewhere between one forty-five and two fifteen that afternoon, right? Correct. And it was reported that her body was found by. Either a South Dakota, um, you know, game, game fish and parks employee, game fish and parks employee. Um, more on that in a minute. At about three thirty, wasn't it? I don't remember right offhand what the time he came. If it was three thirty or two thirty, there's a lot of inconsistencies in that. And mm -hmm. in the last six years, I I don't recall the exact time, and so I don't want to misquote that. Okay. Um, I know that they believe he found her very close to the time of her death it had not been that much time because they that's how they were able to get a time of death out of it was right. between that time that text came and the time the time, time that the floors parks okay. employee found her so i'm just picturing this you you park your car you grab your fishing pole you find a spot to fish from you're going to be a distance from your car I assume because she had no identification on her, she didn't have her phone, she didn't have her purse, that they immediate that the employee who found her immediately did not know her identity. He just here's a dead woman, um, and the police had presumably in the water. There's it, a, here's it, a dead woman in the water. In the water, right? And the police had presumably found her car at some point and run the plates and figured out. And then contacted the grandparents and Tony, I'm guessing, saying, hey, we found Alicia's car. Where's Alicia? I'm just wondering at what point this employee reported finding her versus the time they found the car and are trying to find her. It seems like they should have put that together long before 5 or 5.30 in the afternoon. The, the car was not very far from the body. Um, right. You know, That's there's two parking that it wasn't very far, so it wouldn't probably taken that much time. But again, I'm not an investigator, so I only know 
what I, you know, what I can speculate, what I see in true crime, but is part of the reason that they state she is missing because he, you know, they have to stay, they have to figure out if he has an alibi. So, or the family, you know, who, who did this to her? And we're going to tell them that she's missing to see how they react versus to stating she's passed. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's, you know, you think about it that way in my mind, that's the only way I can make it work is what are people's reactions going to be if I say she is missing and maybe that gives them more time then without people bombarding them or, you know, they are able to do their investigation at the, the crime scene mm-hmm. versus telling the family, oh, we found Alicia. She's, she's dead. What we believe is by homicide. Right. And now we have people freaking out. We don't, our investigation is, yeah, no, we're not able to investigate the way we want to. I that's mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but that's an excellent point. Um, and that's probably how it played out. Um, when you talk to Tony at between five and five thirty, you both you both agreed. Am I correct that whichever one of you heard from Alicia first would call the other and say, "Hey, I just talked to her. She's fine," or or whatever. That was the arrangement. Correct. And then you didn't hear from Tony. The next thing you heard about 9 nine thirty that night was the dci calling you to tell you that she'd been murdered is that accurate so tony was texting i would get him like through text um and that but there was a lull there when he must have made it into town and made it to vermilion to the sheriff's office that things went quiet and i, I was talking to her grandparents at the time you know, because when Tony called me, I went and called her grandparents and said, is this true? Is mm-hmm. this what's really happening? What what can I do to help? You know, how can I help? Do you want me calling people? I The last thing I want to do is step on someone's toes. Right. And if they don't want me involved, I'm not going to get involved. Um, and so when they collaborated what he was saying that, yes, she is missing, And I was in contact with them as well as in contact with Tony. When we both lost contact with Tony, we didn't know what was going on. Is it because he was being questioned? Is it because he had gotten there? Did he know something we didn't know? You know, I don't know. Um, He eventually called me, but I heard it straight from DCI that she was murdered. Um, I didn't hear it from Tony. I didn't hear it from her grandparents. I was the one that got you know, a call from a DCI agent to tell me that they had found her and um, that they believe her death was by homicide. Okay. And presumably once he was contacted and told, you know, Alicia's missing and had contacted you, he's presumably driving from Pierre down to Vermilion to see what's going on. Um, But DCI tells you that she's been found dead, presumed of a homicide. And you had you you said you'd gotten text from Tony. I'm assuming normal police procedure is you notify the next of kin. If, if it's a married person, you notify the spouse. You know, uh, you notify a person's roommate, their parents, whatever. Um, so it's it's safe to say the DCI contacted Tony, or someone did before they contacted you. Correct. Um, yes, I I'm would assume. Yes, yeah, that assuming, he was probably. Yeah. Now, I was just going to say, I would assume that it was Tony or uh, Alicia's grandparents who said, hey, you need to call Bethany and tell her as well. Um, otherwise, how would the DCI know anything about you? They don't have her phone. They don't have her wallet. So how do they even know about you? Uh, that, my assumption is that was Tony that what? would have told them because Alicia's grandmother called me to state, did you hear? And I said, yes, I just got off the phone with a DCI. And she said, they came to my door and told me. So she had the agents at her door. Tony, I assume was told when he went to Vermilion Mm -hmm. to, to the office to deal with that. And I got, you know, a phone call then, and it would have been him to say, this is who I was talking to or whether they went through his phone at that point. I don't know what that looks like. And I guess I never had a conversation with Tony of, hey, how did it go down, you know, right. after you got there? 
it, it just wasn't something on my mind six right. years ago. So it seems it seems likely that he gets down there, he gets to the office, they tell him, and then he's sitting there talking to them because obviously they want to talk to him um, and tells them, hey, you need to call Beth because he can't do it himself. He's busy talking to the police. Um, that seems likely um, to be what happened there. Okay, well, that, that clears up that timeline um, a little bit. Um, did, um, obviously, they didn't find your cell phone ever. Did, uh, do you know, I, I assume this was done, but no one said it's been done, so I, I just have to ask, uh, did the police search her cell phone usage, look through her texts, you know, they can they can go to the cell phone service provider and say, okay, where did this phone ping? When was the last call sent? When was the last text sent? Did they go through all that to see if there was anything else after the message about the couple making love in the, in the park? Right. Um, yes. Um, you know, I was involved. I was that, you know, after I was told that she was murdered, I was asked to go in um, to talk to the investigators the following morning. And I want to say it was a 9, 10 o'clock meeting. Somewhere the next day, June 2nd, was my meeting with them. And, you know, they wanted the Snapchat records. the You know, what the timeline was that was on Snapchat so they could get, you know, were these photos that she's posting on Snapchat, were they prior to this last text message? Were they after this text message. I mean, there was a lot of people working with DCI and trying to make sure that they knew what was going on. You know, I knew that the last text she got because that text was sent to me to say, hey, look, I haven't talked to her, but this is the last thing I heard from her. And it was screenshotted and sent to me. And so they were able to get that information too, you know, and share and anything that I had went to them, um, you know, as well as who she may have contacted, you know, names of important people in her life. Um, you know, there was things that, you know, the phone was off. So that's the thing I want to preface is when I tried to call Alicia's phone at 5 30, 6 o'clock when Tony got a hold of me, her phone went straight to voicemail. It wasn't like I was getting rings like it was on, you know, right. it was like there was nothing, um, you know, like someone's phone is dead. Mm -hmm. And so we were told that, um, you know, at first they were, they, yes, they tried to ping it, but they couldn't get an exact location because of multiple towers. You know, th that is one thing that Tony told me. Another thing he told me was that it did ping, but it pinged in Des Moines, but DCI came back and said, nah, that wasn't a right ping. It was a, it was an oddball, mm -hmm. you know, that happens. It's, they're not able to get anything good off of what that phone and the location of the phones in that area um, right. because yeah, of the, the area. towers, right? The towers. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't recall ever hearing straight from DCI if they were or not. Um, but Tony did tell me within, you know, shortly after her death that, that they did tell him that they were, you know, they did run the ping. They did try and do things, but you know, mm -hmm. they didn't really get anywhere. It's so frustrating when, when uh, on the one hand, it seems like the issue of the phone it really bugs me because to me, one of two things happened. The phone was either thrown in the river or whoever killed her took it with them, which is an awfully dangerous thing to do. Everybody knows that cell phones can be traced. You're not only taking evidence with you, but it's possible they're tra even in just six years ago that they're going to track it with GPS. I think everyone would know that. So to take it with you would be a really foolish thing to do. That would not be an organized and well thought out uh, killer kind of thing to do. But also on the same token, it's not organized and well thought out to leave your shoes behind either. And there were a pair of shoes that are found there for no reason that very well could belong to the killer or not, no one knows. So on the one hand, it seems like you've got a disorganized kind of not thinking real clearly, not planning this out or being very thorough killer. And on the other hand, you're like, well, okay, this is broad daylight, a public area. Anyone could have walked up or seen anything at any time. And if it's this person is this disorganized and clueless and haphazard and chaotic, 
how in the hell did no one see them or catch them? And how have they not been caught or seen since then? Because certainly they would have done this again or given themselves away in some way. It doesn't make sense at all. You know, I've not been to Myron Grove um, very often. I've been there once. Um, and that was on our five-year anniversary. And even, even within that five years, on her five-year anniversary, there were still people there that were not associated with, with Alicia's memorial. Um, you know, coming and going within the hour that we were there. And so to me, it's crazy that no one is coming forward or, or should I say that police are stating no one is coming forward that was there that day, you know, yeah. um, that, that that's, you know, it bugs me. It's, it's hard. It's hard to come up with. Why is that? But is that because everyone is just too scared to talk? No one, you know, well, if I talk, then that means I now have a target on me or, you know, I just, I feel like people are, are so scared to do anything anymore. We just, you know, it's just easier just to keep quiet. And unfortunately, keeping quiet has kept this case open for six years. That could be. And how you do that, even with the danger to yourself, knowing that that person is still out there and that there are more Alicia's out there. Um, how do you, how do you live with that? I, I, I'd like to think, of course, it's easy to say this sitting in this chair, but I'd like to think my thought pattern would be, if I put this person in prison, then I'm safe from them, even if they know I'm the one who put them in prison. But armchair investigator, easy thing to say. Um, but you're right. Yeah, I mean, it's here it is. It's June 1st. So all the kids are out of school. Um, it's a beautiful day. It's a popular, well-visited area. Um, there, there are people making love in the bushes. Um, how are there not more people out fishing, boating, hiking, camping? How, how did no one see anything other than the local resident who reported seeing a car and then couldn't remember anything about it? it, it it's so or baffling. The, it I mean, so unlikely. And from my understanding, it was the Game Fish and Parks employee that met met the car that noticed the car um, among other people who had been around to hear it. But yes. again, nothing is, is, is concrete to state like, hey, this is, this is what we know. We know it's this color. We know it's this type of car. I mean, even right. when I was questioned, it wasn't specific in any way. Do you know anyone with a dark colored sedan? Do you know anyone with tinted windows? Do you know anyone that might have a loud exhaust? Not a loud exhaust that is, well, you can make it loud, but a loud exhaust like something's broken. Yeah. You know, to come up with those and to say, oh, yeah, that person has that, you know, is it black? Is it blue? Is it, you know, dark mm -hmm. color? could be a lot of different colors. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's just so guess, frustrating. Have, have this, this Game Fish Parks employee, have they ever named this person publicly? Do, but the police know exactly who this is. They know the identity of this worker, I assume. Correct. But this no, person, they have not. Nothing. They, so, They've never said who it is. But again, yeah, I mean, we want to protect the identity of this person. We don't want to put them, you know, a, a target on them on television, but correct. It, or if that's who they saw, if they saw the killer. Yeah. It's one of the things I don't that know. It's that, really easy to go against someone and find out, oh, yeah, I was game fishing parks. Okay. It's this person. Yeah. I mean, just, I'd want to keep that person safe too. I can't yeah. blame them for it. Yeah. I agree. Um, and, and, uh, it just bugs me that Sheriff Howe hasn't come out and said, you know, we know this employee. Maybe it's just an assumed thing. And maybe I'm just doing what you do in a case where you don't have easy answers and just looking in every dark little corner for some meaningless clue that you hope means something. Um, it's easy to point fingers. Yeah. It's very easy to point fingers. It is. You know? and, um, and I don't I don't like doing it. I don't like trying to jump to conclusions. Is there a lot of things that make Tony look really bad? Yep, there are. Was it a good marriage? No, it wasn't. But he would be the first to tell you that. He would be the first right. to tell you that he made a lot of mistakes. But, you know, I went to high school with Tony. I, I've known Tony since I was what, 16 years old. You know, for me to think that he would be behind all this is really hard for me to swallow. And I yeah. don't want to think that. I don't want to think that in my small town, that someone would be capable of that to take away someone that meant so much 
to them at one point in time and so much to everyone else be over something so small that she didn't have anything. It's not like she had a ton of money or she, it was, you know, they were, they were young. They were out of, out of college. You, you have tons of student debt. What right. taking her out, what's that going to gain? Nothing. Yeah. I can't imagine she had some million dollar life insurance policy or anything like that. And the police have said that Tony was in Pierre. Um, you can't have a much more airtight alibi than being that far away. Um, and certainly everybody is innocent until proven guilty. The police never said he's a suspect or a person of interest. Um, they say they have suspects, but we don't know who those people are. Um, and, and yeah, but I mean, the suspicion does turn to the spouse when any married person is, is murdered, particularly if it's, in, if you're in the process of a divorce. So it's natural that myself and other people have questions about Tony, but there's no, no evidence at all suggesting that, that he's guilty of anything here. Um, it just looks really bad. That's it looks bad because there's no other that, answer. You know, yeah. in, did uh, right. You get married, you get married, um, you know, a year and a half later to the person you were cheating on your wife with. I mean, you don't have anything to do with the investigation. Like all yeah. those cards stack up against you, but at the end of the day, they weren't really together. They weren't, well, they were by all means in their mind divorced. I mean, yeah, living emotionally, lives. Yeah, emotionally, emotionally they were cut off. checked out a long time ago before. Correct. Then. Correct. Um, so it's just, you know, I don't, uh, you know, a question I get was she questioned. I, I was told she was questioned. You know, she has just the airtight as al alibi as, as he does. I don't know her personally. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, state how she is who she is or anything of that nature right um you know clearly he fell in love with her and mm -hmm. and she made him happy in ways that alicia didn't and at the end of the day uh, alicia would want tony to be happy whether they had an awful marriage or not she loved him enough to state that he deserved to be happy and this sort of thing happens every day and it almost never leads to murder so yeah um like you said, it's easy to point. And Tony does sometimes being his own worst enemy. Um, like you said, he's not cooperating with police. He's moved to another state. Um, and I wouldn't say he's not cooperating with police. Well, I would not go to say that. I would say he's not necessarily actively helping to find who did this. He is not. He's not helping her family. He's not helping her friends. He's he's closed ties off to anyone that was remotely close to Alicia to keep, I'm sure to keep himself safe and to move on. I mean, when you, he got married, he got bombarded. People were not okay with the fact that he yeah. got remarried that close and people were nasty to him. Mm -hmm. Do I think it's fair of him to, you know, completely shut me out of his life? No, but does that keep him happy? Does that make him able to move on with his life? Yes. So at the end of the day, it is what it is. And it happened. I right. wouldn't say he's not he's not cooperating. I'm sure he's cooperating with police. He's just not necessarily actively helping those that are trying to find Alicia's killer. Right. He's not talking to other the press. than you know the police. Right. He's yeah. just he's moved on and you That's know, he moved on the do. way he could. Yeah. Doesn't make you a murderer. Correct. Wow. It's it's a shame that among everything else that you've lost the friendship that you had with him, which is something that, you know, predates the marriage. Um, it's collateral damage when things like this happen, I guess. Um, a final point I want to make sure we touch on just to be thorough. Um, the police, uh, it's, it's been made public that the police informed the family that Alicia was not sexually assaulted. And again, they have the autopsy. And we certainly hope she wasn't, but they have the autopsy, so they should know for sure. But uh, the reason given, I thought, was odd. Uh, they said she wasn't sexually assaulted because the killer didn't have time. We've got an open window of 30 minutes here from 145, her last text, the one you got, to 215, around the time she was discovered um, by the employee. Um, that's plenty of time to sexually assault someone. Um, I'm just, I take them at their word and certainly hope that that's true. 
but it's an odd reason to put out publicly that, well, they didn't have time. Of course they had time. Why didn't you say we have the autopsy and we know she wasn't? You know, that makes more sense to me. It just seems an odd thing to say. You know, I think about so the gruesome details of her murder. You know, it, it, we know she fought. Um, it was very, uh, Alicia had an open casket. So I'm just going to put that out there. It was an open mm-hmm. casket. You were able to see she was beaten. I mm-hmm. mean, bruises show. Yeah. Air was missing. You know, they tried the best they could to make her look good. And at the end of the day, it, I was glad that it was an open casket because it made it real. It made it, it gave people closure. But you could tell she fought. So if, if I'm thinking about it, if I'm fighting for my life and someone's trying to take me out, it's going to take quite some time to do that. If I'm bashing your head in and you're still not going unconscious and you're fighting me, I mean, I work in a behavior, I work with behavior kids, that's my job. When someone's mm-hmm. running on adrenaline, it's really hard to, to overpower them. So if she's yeah. running on adrenaline to stay alive and they're running on adrenaline to whatever, kill her, mm-hmm. um, It's not going to be an easy one, two, three. It's not like they took a bullet to her head. You know, it was, she was, she was badly beaten in the head and then her throat was slashed, whatever. They say it's not enough to, it wasn't enough to kill her. So slashed her throat and then you, she had to be put into water, not just thrown, but put into the water and she was put into water in a place where you think about the Missouri and you think it's fast moving, a lot of current. And she was placed in a spot that that current didn't take her. So I imagine if I'm dead weight now, because you have me knocked out, it's not an easy move. No matter where she was assaulted at, whether she was assaulted up at her car, whether she was assaulted in between the car and the dock, or even assaulted on the dock, regardless dead body weight of 130 pounds, 150 pounds. I don't know how much she weighed, but in that, that's a lot of work. So 30 minutes to me is not a lot of time because not only did they have to get her body in the water, but then they had to dispose of things because obviously they disposed of the purse, Mm -hmm. you know? So did, is what happened? They were trying to dispose of everything and they heard the car coming. Oh, we need to get going. There's a car coming because you can hear it. It's a gravel road. There's a car coming. Jump in the car. Dispose of what we can. And like you say, sloppy. Leave the shoes. Yeah. There's there's not enough time because now someone's coming because it took longer because she did fight. She did. You know, it was. I I guess in my mind, thirty minutes is is not a lot of time to kill someone if they're fighting and it's not shooting them. You know. Yeah. Not like she was stabbed. Right. Yeah, they were trying. It sounds like they were trying everything to get it done. Well, it it's clear if there's one thing that's without question, uh, in my experience investigating this whole thing, it's that Alicia wasn't the only one who had that kind of friend. Uh, uh, You're not the only one who had that kind of friend. She clearly had that kind of friend and still does in you because here you are six years later with your husband, your children, your own life, your own family, and you spend so much time championing her cause, fighting for justice for her through the Facebook page and all the media you do, this show being a small part of that. And uh, everyone should be lucky enough to have as good a friend as you as well, I have to say. Um, Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I've always said, though, you know, if I didn't fight, if I wasn't the wing woman she made me, or I mean, it's it is very cliche, but that's what she would refer to me as. You know, no one should just be a number. She'd just be another cold case or another yeah. murder. I don't ever want someone to refer to my best friend as a number, as a cold case. I want her to say her name. She has a name. Say it, you know. That, that's what I want. I, I want to keep her story alive because the minute it becomes a story that no one hears about, 
is the minute people quit fighting. And unfortunately, living in the small town, my parents living in the small town, um, I went to high school where Tony went to high school where we both graduated and living now in a small town, not even 30 minutes away from where she was murdered. People don't know her story still to this day. Don't. Oh, I guess I've never heard of Alicia Hummel. I don't know. Or, you know, like I have show you, I have my fighting for justice for Alicia Hummel in her, you know, 6, 27, 85 and 6, 1 of 2015. And I'll see people look at me in the store and they just kind of look and like, huh, I wonder what that is about. You can just see it. You can see yeah. their, their wheels turning and they have no idea. Don't have any clue. I've done countless, countless, countless interviews. Yeah. I've talked to countless people. And guess what? There's still a lot of people out there that don't know about her. And so you keep fighting because someday there might be that one person that hears it. That's like, exactly. yeah, I ran into her. Oh, she looks really familiar. You yeah. know, I saw something that day. Yeah. Someone right. told me something. It, not knowing what the police have, you don't know what tiny little seemingly unimportant fact could be that piece of the puzzle that they need to point them where they need to go and get a resolution. And Correct. yeah, you're so right. This has got to be kept going. And uh, as long as we've got the show, you've got an outlet here. Um, we are dedicated to doing this kind of thing. Um, Josh and I are both career law enforcement and that uh, means a lot to us. Um, and I want to thank you for being a part of this and agreeing to do this. Uh, it's pretty awesome of you. And we're, we're grateful. And I know our viewers are going to be grateful too. Well, thank you for sharing her story on a national a national audience. We definitely appreciate it getting out of small town South Dakota. Happy to. Happy to put it out there. Happy to be a part of it. It's, you know, our our dream is not to like, you know, be one of those YouTube shows with 10 million followers and, you know, getting money from ads and all that. Our dream is like we'll make a difference someday. We'll learn something someday about one of these cases. Um, the true crime ones that we do are the ones that matter the most and we try to work the hardest on. We received information that has never been revealed to the public, information that turned our investigation upside down and challenged everything we thought we knew about this case. We're going to share that information with you now, directly from the source. It's the story of a man named Nicholas Bertrand who tells his story publicly for the very first time anywhere, right here, right now. What Nicholas has to say will shock you. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh and I thought we had exhausted every avenue and, and peered into every corner of this tragic and senseless crime in an effort to uncover the truth about what happened to Alicia Hummel that day and why it happened and who was responsible, most importantly, to seek justice for Bethany, for Alicia's family and loved ones, and for her community, and to make sure that the perpetrator or perpetrators of this crime did never do it again. And uh, we thought, as I said, that we'd seen and heard everything. And then quite unexpectedly, out of the blue, we got lucky. And the story of the man I'm about to speak to, Nicholas Bertrand, literally just fell out of the sky and, and hit us. And uh, we were astonished, uh, quite honestly, to learn about Nick's involvement and attachment uh, to this case. Um, he has never spoken publicly about his connection to this case and, and how he got there. And uh, we're very thankful for his courage and his decision to speak out now. And we're honored to be bringing this to the world um, and breaking this story to the public for the very first time in the six plus years it's been since Alicia was murdered. Um, Nick's gonna be joining me shortly. Um, let me improve my vision and see if I can make this call connect. I'm awaiting Nick to accept the meeting so that we can begin the interview. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Steve here, and I'm speaking with Nicholas Bertrand, who has agreed to speak to World of Enigmas and tell his story for the first time ever in a public forum of any kind um, about his experiences and the unusual and uh, kind of startling connection he has to the Alicia Hummel case. Um, Nick, thank you for being on the show. And um, of course. first of all, I should say you're 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 in Minnesota. 
right? Um, actually, no. Now oh. I'm, I'm I'm back in Iowa again. Oh, okay. Well, you're still a bit north of us here in Florida, but um, I had thought that you had lived in Minnesota, but I, I might be wrong about that. Um, but you're not originally from Iowa. You're originally from South Dakota, right? Yep, that's correct. I uh, I grew up in a little town called Jefferson, South Dakota, um, mm -hmm. which is just outside of Sioux City, Iowa. So it's it's kind oh. of all right there together. They call it the tri-state region because you can go from South Dakota to Nebraska to Iowa all within like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right there on the border. You somehow became involved in the investigation into Alicia's murder. Uh, how sure. did that come about? Where were you living at the time? At that time, I was living in Sioux City. Um, I was not quite married to my ex-wife yet, but we were... Or I might have been. I, I don't really know how the timeline works out with that specific. But um, Alicia was really good friends with my ex-wife. Now, I had never met Alicia, um, but I do remember my ex-wife came up to me and was showing me pictures of her. Uh, Alicia had been um, excited about weight loss. Um, she was must have been going through things and my ex-wife would kind of hey my friend's doing really good mm -hmm. um and then it was really weird because she had just showed me a couple pictures of her that like the week that she passed and then all of a sudden out of nowhere my ex-wife comes to me and she says hey uh my friend just died and you know she was distraught she wanted to go pay her respects so we did some research and looked up a few things and ended up finding out where it had happened mm -hmm. and uh, we drove up there and when we got there when we got down this road there were still sheriffs and police officers and everything all the way down this road and i mean i had thought that was kind of suspicious myself um but we drove down the road and uh, they stopped us and pulled us off to the side. Now, we never actually got anywhere near where she had been murdered. Um, we got stopped be on the long gravel road. I think it's gravel. I can't remember right yeah. now. Yeah, um, Bethany said it is. Yeah, uh, we got stopped and pulled off, and they, they asked if they could talk to us. And uh, from what my understanding was, they said that what they were looking for was a dark-colored sedan with mm -hmm. a loud exhaust and I had just put a glass pack on I had a I know Volvo I don't remember what year it was it was kind of a crap car <laughs> but I just put a glass pack on it a few days prior to going up there mm -hmm. and that that was what raised their alarm was hey this car kind of matches the description oh. of a dark colored sedan with a loud exhaust right. uh, so, so from there they took us to the police station where they spread it split us up and questioned us in, individually and um we went through questioning they i don't really remember the questions they asked per se um but they did they did question us both and then they let us go and it seemed like they they just kind of kept popping up they and it was the dci agents they just kind of kept coming in and out of our lives um they went so far as to ask me to do a polygraph test, and um, I did. I did do the polygraph test. Now, this is – I have an issue with South Dakota and their the way they do things in general. Mm -hmm. um, so I went in and I did my polygraph test, and they cleared me of being involved in the murder. They were like, oh, yeah, we can tell that you aren't – you didn't kill her, but we think you know who did. And we want you to tell us. And I looked at him. I actually got mad. I I was very upset. I'm like, man, if I knew who killed this girl, if I knew anything, that's not worth my life in prison to keep information from from this. Like, right. I I was irate. And then after that, I gave them the car that I was driving. I gave them permission to come into my home and take pictures of the boots I was wearing mm -hmm. all the time. Or all my, They actually took a picture of all my shoes and they, they wanted to know about any knives that I had or any weapons of any sort. 
and I let them have everything. And since then, oh, I gave them my DNA and I gave them my fingerprints. And since then, they've left me alone. Um, I haven't had any contact with them since. And that was wow. what I want to say. I don't know how long it's been since, but I, I believe it was like two to four years after the actual incident was the very last time I had any contact with them. Wow. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. So your wife at the time found out, was it the same day that she found out that Alicia was killed or was it the next day? I don't know. I, it, it all happened really fast. Um, it, I don't believe it was that day. Still so that day, I remember exactly what I was doing and what she was doing. See, my ex-wife, she didn't like to work, um, but she had a job at that time. And she was supposed to be working at a daycare. Well, while she was working at a daycare, oh, this is the other thing that made me a little suspicious to the, uh, the Department of Criminal Investigation in South Dakota. Was I was also fishing that day. Um, I happened to be fishing out at Bacon Creek in Sioux City while she was at work. And I, I remember telling them that, and they kind of thought that was suspicious. The day Alicia was killed, she's fishing. Alicia is fishing in Myron Grove, or, or intending to. Yep. You're on the same river, but, I mean, in another state, you're you're fishing. Were you alone? I mean, did you have anyone? I did go alone. Okay. I did. So there was I, uh, no one who, there who could alibi you and say, hey, yeah, Nick was fishing nope. with me all day. Okay. Nope. And the only thing was I stopped at a gas station mm -hmm. and I didn't know what time I stopped there. It was sometime in the afternoon. I stopped at a gas station on the north side of Sioux City and I I don't know if they ever pulled surveillance cameras, footage or anything from that. I don't know what they if they did anything, but I actually wasn't even fishing on a river. I was fishing on a little pond called okay. Bacon Creek, Bacon Creek Pond. I, it might be connected to a creek or something, but okay. it is called Bacon Creek. But yeah, I was out at a public. And then, you know, there may be even cameras out there, but I don't know if they ever went and pulled the footage. I, did, did uh, Do you think the police uh, suspected your ex-wife of being involved or that maybe the two of you were involved together in some way? If they did, they never made that apparent. Okay. Um, I feel like they were looking at me pretty pretty directly um right and oh yeah the other thing that they found suspicious was that i had scratches on my arms um the kids had kicked a kickball up into an evergreen tree mm -hmm. across the street and actually the neighbors did confirm that that was what had happened i climbed all the way up this evergreen tree to get a kickball out of it for the kids and i do believe that they talked to the neighbors about it and they did confirm that yeah, it's a good way to get scratched up. I grew up around those trees. I can I can confirm that myself. They're, they're, they can be unforgiving. Um, you, you mentioned that you drove by your ex-wife's place of work and you didn't see her car there. So you you were driving the Volvo that they were concerned about, right? Yep, and I was she, driving the Volvo. She had a Kia Forte, which I guess wouldn't have matched the description because it was new, didn't have a lot of exhaust. It it was quiet. But if if the police had suspected her, I would assume that she would have said, well, I was at work. And then whoever her supervisor or employer was there could have said, yeah, she was here all day. You know, that so, makes sense. I, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> so, yeah, I think so. It sounds like, I mean, she wasn't involved either, but it sounds like they were being thorough and checking everybody. And the yep. description of the sedan, you know, a dark sedan with a loud exhaust is like an incredibly vague description. How many vehicles yeah. does that match? But it, it makes sense that they would see your vehicle see that you had recently worked on the exhaust and, and check you out. I mean, it sounds like they yep. were doing their jobs there. Yep, um, and I agree 100%. I, I would have thought it was suspicious too. And knowing the timing, I guess it wasn't very long. And from what I've heard from DCI agents is they hadn't even released the location yet. But wow. my, my ex-wife found it on Facebook is what she, she claimed, what she told me. She's like, yeah, it was... Myron Grove and I did the research. I looked up, uh, there was an article online when, when I Googled it about some people that kayaked from, I believe it was Yankton mm -hmm. and they landed in Myron Grove. And that's where I found out the information about where it was and how to get right. there. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, 
but one of the things Alicia did that helps us give us give us a timeline a little bit is that, you know, it was the first day of her summer vacation. She posted on Facebook that she was going fishing. She was putting pictures on Snapchat. And the last communication anybody got from her was a text at 1.45 in the afternoon. And then around 2.15, her body was discovered. So they know it was in that half an hour window that she was killed. Um, right. So, yeah, anyone who was looking for Alicia that day could have used social media to, to find her. She had photographed um, Myron Grove. So everyone knew where she was, um, which is both good and bad in retrospect, um, because who knows if she was followed there or that that was used by her killer at all. Um, right. So that's that's troubling and uh there was a pair of shoes found at the scene and i'm guessing that's why they were looking at your boots and your shoes um and i'm assuming that if you had had the same size shoes as the ones they found that they they would have been more concerned about that but right. um they they have said sheriff Howe mentioned earlier this year that uh they have lots of evidence but no case um and if they're taking your DNA, that makes me wonder if they have DNA evidence. They've never said whether they do or not. But um, so this went on went there. You and your ex-wife went there probably within 24 hours of the murder, it sounds like. Probably the next day, the next afternoon, maybe. Probably. And it would make sense that they were still out there um, and waiting to see if, if anyone was going to come back. Um, and you mentioned this went on until a couple of years afterward. The, the whole timeline from when you first went out there and had your first contact with the police to you being eliminated as a suspect um, through the DNA and the polygraph and all of that, that, that was approximately how much time did you have to put up with all this? Uh, I want to say four years. Um, wow. So until um, about 2019, you were still... Yep. And wow. I actually recently found out why they came back to investigate me again. This whole time I've been blaming it on the DCI agents and mm -hmm. I was extremely upset with them. But um, my sister may or may not have paranoid schizophrenia. And she recently came clean to me um, while my dad was passing and told me that she had a dream that Alicia came to her in a dream. And granted, she's never met Alicia before. She has no idea who she is. She, my sister lives in Okaboji, and she's, I, I want to say, 47 years old. I never, she had never met Alicia. But according to her, she had a dream that Alicia came to her and told her that I killed her. Oh, wow. So, so she called the police and told them about this. And that's yeah. when they came back to, to investigate me again. Wow. Well, that, that clears up a great deal. And yeah, and the fact that they don't uh, apparently, to our knowledge, have any other suspects um, or persons of interest, and they, they're just exhausting and, and re-going over the same things over and over to see if they missed anything. It makes sense from their point of view that you had to put up with this for so long, and that, that yep. certainly didn't help. Yep. So honestly, I would like to apologize because I know I was pretty harsh with them when they kept coming after like coming after me but when they kept um investigating me and I, I i was pretty mean until recently i found out why they came back again and i felt bad for being so just distraught towards the department of criminal investigations in south dakota i i had no idea that my sister had done that or said anything and um, I did feel bad i i didn't contact them because i mean who wants to contact the dci <laughs> right yeah but um, if they, if any of them end up watching this or listening to this, um, I, I do apologize for any any um, insensitivity that I had towards them in this situation. I do understand that their job is hard, and I do understand that they they're grasping at straws from what it sounds like. And um, I just wasn't really understanding of that at the time. I I just wanted them to leave me alone. <laughs> Well, yeah, and that's perfectly understandable. And that's something that police are very familiar with. You know, if you're, my father was a homicide detective. And one of the things he told me a long time ago, uh, when I was a kid and first started getting interested in this kind of thing, he said, uh, 
you know, if we were looking for, say, a murder suspect and we pick someone up, bring them in to the station, you know, you handcuff them to the wall in an interrogation room and you say, I'll be right back. And then you go out and you wait for a long, long time and leave them sit there in this room. He said, an innocent person gets stir crazy because they know they didn't do anything wrong. They resent being there. They know you're wasting your time and they, they get angry. They get defensive and, and they act in much the same way that you described that you acted kind of uh, rude to them. Whereas a guilty person knows they're guilty and is thinking about it, knows they're caught. And he said, some of them fell asleep while they're waiting because they'd been, on the, they'd been on the run for days or hours and panicked about whether or not they were going to give and now it's, it's over they know they're caught so uh your behavior makes perfect sense and um if, if any if anyone and i'm hoping that the dci and uh, sheriff howe and others do see this we did reach out to sheriff howe's office uh twice and request interviews and we did not receive a response um, which I, is neither here nor there. We're just a couple of guys on YouTube. I, I don't expect them to jump when I call. But um, I, if, if anyone sees this and has any doubts um, about your innocence, my first thought w when you agreed to speak to us was, well, if he had anything to do with it, why would he talk to me? Why would he put himself out there and cast the, uh, the glare and the public attention on himself if he were getting away with it all this time? So... Um, but it, it still does take a lot of courage for someone in your position to step up and offer this information and offer to help. And who knows what information is going to lead to cracking this case. The police know more than any of us do. And yeah. something that seems insignificant to us and meaningless uh, might be the piece of the puzzle they need to put it all together. Right. So uh, we're extremely grateful that... Uh, you agreed to do this and speak out in public uh, for the first time. And uh, I want to thank you for that. Again, it take, takes a lot of courage and, and I know all our viewers are going to appreciate it. I just uh, personally, I, I don't know what it's like to lose somebody like that in, in such a, such a way that it's, you didn't get to say goodbye. You didn't get to, you didn't get to know that it was coming and that then not knowing why or or what the purpose was right. that i i can't imagine and i i just i hope that something comes up and something happens and they figure out at least why yeah justice would be nice um the more you think about this case the more tragic it is here's a young woman who's a couple of weeks from her 30th birthday, who has a career she loves and is getting ready to divorce her husband and, and move on into the next phase of her life and her future is literally wide open. And it was taken from her in such a brutal and terrible way. Um, yeah, we certainly share your, your thoughts there that it's, it's terrible. No one should have to go through that. And that's one of the things that motivates us to do this show and these investigations. It's that we hope you know, we get lucky and somehow contribute to helping bring some justice to the family and to the victims. Uh, certainly, whoever did this doesn't need to be walking around. They need to be put away. Exactly. So, um, and we appreciate you uh, helping us make efforts in that direction. Um, uh, before I let you go, I know you're, you've got a lot going on and I appreciate your time. I don't want to take too much of it. Is there anything else you can think of um, related to the subject that our viewers might want to know? Um, I do know that from, from what I've heard and everything, Alicia was a great person. She had a heart of gold. She was, from everything I've heard, she was, she was a phenomenal individual. I mean, she was a derby dame, which I thought was really cool. Right. Uh, she she did roller derby. She she did not deserve this. And I don't care if you were some kid in college there and you got caught doing something you shouldn't have been doing. You you, you messed up. Come forward. Just come forward and be done with it. It's got to be weighing so heavy. I mean, to know that you did this to somebody, 
and to to sit there and wallow in it every day knowing that this family is hurting is wrong just come clean come forward get it off your chest take take the consequences that's that's all well, anybody asks i i couldn't have said that any better um that's terrific and i agree 100 percent um Wow, I don't have any more questions. All I have is is gratitude again for your time and you speaking out. Uh, I want to remind the viewers again, nickbertrand.herenow.com. Uh, check out Nick's music. And thank you so much for uh, being part of this. Thank you. Well, I'm here with Steve, and we're going to discuss Alicia Hummel's murder and the theories of what possibly could have happened. So Steve, you want to tell the audience, um, you know, some of the details of the things that you've done to gather the information? Uh, well, this has been by far our biggest investigation and most complicated yet, uh, even more so than the Zachary Bernhardt case. Uh, as you know, when we started this, we thought this is, I hate to say, put it in these terms, but like kind of a routine unsolved murder. There didn't seem to be a whole lot other than the mystery of who killed her on the surface of it, but the more we got into it, the more complex layers that we found to this, and it led in so many unexpected directions. Um, the best of which was uh, our scoop, our interview with Nicholas Bertrand. Yes. Um, I, I think uh, hats off to us. Uh, let's pat ourselves on the back. We got that interview when Investigation Discovery Channel did a program on Elisa's murder. They tried to get Nick's interview and couldn't, and we got it. First ones to bring it to the world, so I'm really proud of that, and I hope it helps us and Alicia's family get some kind of resolution to this. Yeah, we, we ended up getting a lot of information. Yeah, more than and, we ever expected. Um, these, you know, the, everybody that participated in this that was willing to, uh, you know, help us tell her story, um, it was just amazing. Yeah, Bethany was just a godsend, and she has been from the start of this. If you look around, she's been at the forefront of the efforts to keep Alicia's name out there, keep this an active story and in the public eye so that this doesn't become just another unsolved cold case. Um, and Nick's interview, I have to say, we got um, through the unexpected assistance of a third party who is going to remain nameless for obvious reasons but right. if that person's watching and I hope they are thank you you know who you are um, because Nick's story was the game changer for this for me we appreciate everything you guys done all right so let's get to why we're here so we're gonna tell the theories of what we think uh, first theory is I remember we, we as we were investigating the case we thought possible um, encounter with strangers at the park. So, um, moment of passion, um, trying to hide what was discovered. So, my thought with that is a possible theory could be when she went to the park and was posting online about, you know, what she had discovered and I think the quote was, it's a good time to get it on. Was yeah, that it? it must be a good day to get it on or something right. like that. She saw a couple making love out of the... And the a possible theory was... The, the official police stance on this is that they believe it was a, an unexpected crime of opportunity from a stranger who didn't know Alicia at all. Right. That's what Sheriff Howe has said, and that's their, their public stance on this, at least. And... You can make that argument. The things that stand out to me about this is that, one, she was not sexually assaulted. Right. Two, she was not robbed. Her purse was found a year later with the money and everything intact. So whoever did this did it to kill her, right. not to get anything else. This was clearly murder intent. Now, if it was, if it was a crime of opportunity in, with the intent to hide you know, whatever had been seen or discovered for no witnesses, they wouldn't necessarily steal anything or sexually assault her in any way. They would simply be like, okay, well, this person can tell on us. We need to, we need to get her quiet. Right. And so they took that opportunity and attacked her. If, now, if that's, that would be more 
understandable. Yeah, if you're going with the theory that it was the couple that she caught, right? Um, I I guess that's possible. That theory doesn't really appeal to me all that much, just because I'm assuming that these two people who got caught making love by Alicia um, were just ordinary common people. Not one of them was a psychopath, or they were both psychopaths, or serial killers, or mentally disturbed. And there's really nothing on record of who these people were. It was just, no. we only know that they were there because she had mentioned it. There's no way to know. So, I mean, if you take a situation, there's two people out there making love in the woods, say they're married or whatever, they don't want this to be public. They don't know if she's made this public or not. They see her, she was obviously on her phone because she texted about it. So, is your first reaction, if you're just a normal person who's cheating, we need to kill this woman so no one finds out. Right, right. And if that's the case, then one or both people, one person, one of the couple had to kill her or they had to do it together. together. To go from illicit lovers to partners in a murder. Almost like a Bonnie and Clyde is, thing. Is a big leap, I think. Yeah. Um, I would think your first steps would be, uh, hey lady, you didn't take any pictures of that. Look, hey, we're not all supposed to be out here. We're married, whatever. Uh, please don't tell anyone or threaten her or something other than let's immediately go to a very sloppy and haphazard kind of murder and hope we get away with that. Um, and it's not really, is it really known if there was a lot of people out there? I mean, according to what we've heard in the reports, there wasn't really a lot of people out there. Well, that's the baffling thing. Here it is, it's the first week of June, school's out, right. I assume. Um, it's a beautiful day, Alicia's out there going fishing, it's a popular area with the locals to go fishing and boating and, and you know, down the river. Um, uh, even Sheriff Howe has said, how is it that no one saw anything? And this happened right. in a public area uh, easily accessible to the public. Anyone literally could have driven up and seen this murder taking place or someone running away or whatever. Right. Or been going down the river and seen something happening on the shore or seen it from across the river. How is it no one saw anything? Because no one has come forward to say, hey, I was out there and I heard a scream or I saw this or I saw that. No one has said anything. It's astonishing to me. It was, it was the middle of the afternoon, beautiful June day, popular fishing spot, how is it Alicia and her murderer or murderers were the only people there? Right. It, it, it's not, it boggles the mind. It it's really very does. frustrating. But it seems to be the case. It's been five years and no one has come forward. So, possible, but maybe not likely. It's the couple making love, that's my stance, possible but unlikely. To go from illicit lovers to murderers and and by I the way they have to I be keeping this pact to this day so are they still lovers or is one of them keeping the secret for the other well I you mean, know if murders neither, involved, you'd stay quiet whether it's still going on or not neither of them has any kind of pangs of conscience neither of them thought maybe anonymously look i'll just call the police you know if they've split up right how long do, has this been a five-year love affair or longer you know what i mean it just right it defies plausibility yep. or probability for me, it's it, it's possible but unlikely in my mind. I can I can um, respect that. That's a fair statement. And the the other alternative, if it's it's a sudden crime of opportunity, oh hey look somebody I can kill, no one's looking. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking about a a disorganized spur of the moment. And that would lead us killer. That would lead us into our next theory. You know, is it was it somebody prowling? Was it somebody just, you know? seeking an opportunity and saw a free opportunity to do it? Could it have been just someone random with violent tendencies? Well, one of the things I asked Bethany, who's been on top of this and knows more about this than we do, is that have there been any reports of a serial killer in that area or similar killings on the river or in that area with a similar MO, kind of a disorganized sloppy, slash them across the throat, hit them in the head, then drown them because I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not good at what I'm doing. Right. This would um, have to be somebody who does have violent tendencies, but would probably be really rookie at their job. Yeah, like they they they're still evolving and trying to you know trying to find their pattern. Right, you have an edge weapon, you slash someone's throat, but you still need it, to hit them over the head I think and drown was, them to kill them. I think I think you know what was done was very excessive and extreme, and it, it brings to question: Would somebody you know who who had opportunity to kill? 
really go to such an extent? It seems amateurish. It does seem spur of the moment in that way, but it doesn't seem like this is someone who's done this before. Right. So if you're, there's two essential kinds of serial killers, the organized, methodical, stalk them, plan every detail and try to get away without leaving any evidence, right. kind of Ted Bundy kind of killer, and then, or Zodiac, and then there's the disorganized, kind of mentally unhinged, sloppy, spur of the moment kind of killer, which that would be what we'd be looking for in this case. Right. Okay, say it's that person. Had they com There's no other murders before or since Alicia's murder in this area that have a similar M.O. Right. So, was this this person's first murder and they got away with it but just barely so they're not trying it again? Or was this someone who had done it before and just no one's ever found any of their other victims? Neither seems plausible to me. So, again, it's possible but unlikely to me, just like with the couple, that this was some disorganized, sloppy serial killer who tried three times before they finally killed her and then left their shoes behind exactly. and got away in a noisy vehicle. Because there was different forms of evidence. You said there was like a pair of gloves? Is there a, a pair, a pair of, of shoes. There's a pair of shoes. Yeah, yeah. there's a pair of shoes. They said there... Uh, a pair of shoes. Her bag was, was thrown off by the bank. Yeah. The so phone. obviously the, the phone was still in there. Nothing was really no. stolen. So that means... Someone with who does take opportunities isn't like carrying a pair of rubber gloves in their back pocket, so prints would have had to have been all over it. Well, if you drown someone, there might not necessarily be prints. Or or if, you, well, if they threw the, the purse and stuff. if they threw the purse in if they didn't go through the purse and they just tossed it in the river and it washed up a year later, there wouldn't be any prints on that either. But you mentioned the phone. Right. They never recovered the phone. That's been a big point of contention. That's one of the things I asked Bethany was did they dive the river? Did they go looking for the phone? Because how far can you throw a cell phone? You know, if the killer just, and then that lends support to the kind of, there's something on the phone the killer didn't want them to see. Right. So possibly and, that and couple... And in this day and age, if you really don't want information to go out there, taking taking the phone and making that disappear is probably the smartest Right. Moment. You don't want to take it with you. It could be traced or tracked, you know, GPS, whatever. But so, you definitely don't want to leave it there so someone right. else can go through it. So let's say they throw the phone in the river. Or while they're struggling with her in the water, it dislodges from her pocket and floats away. It's anything's possible. But they never found the phone. I think that's a telling point. And I think if they had found the phone, that there might have been information on it that evidence. could have helped. But no, the phone is, is lost, just like the identity of the killer at this point. So... so could it be where she was being watched, she was being followed, and at the opportune moment that they took between the 30 minutes, supposedly, from when she posted her last Facebook post to when the ranger found her dead in the water, the killer made his move in order to, you know. Yeah, committed a sloppy murder got away possibly leaving their shoes behind. Um, the, the shoes, I, I really can't make sense of the shoes and what was the point of that. And maybe they're unrelated. It's just one of those things that you, you can't help but wonder if it's part of the picture. But to, uh, speaking of, of her husband, Tony, um, and we have to because anytime a married woman is murdered, well, so just the statistically, statistically the six always show that yeah, the someone they know and the, interest. the spouse yeah. and the, and could be related to the murder, if not all, all you know, is related yeah. to the murder because of, you know, whatever reason, whether they just were unhappy with the marriage and they lost it, or, you know, a crime of passion yeah. uh, because the, the individual can't control, you know, their emotions, or just straight up murder because they hate them, or she cheated, or... You, you know what I'm saying? Right. Well, Statistically, yeah. you know, the, the spouse is uh, in the spotlight for that. But let's say for, for the sake of this theory that, you know, the husband is the one involved. So, I mean, what would you think? Do you think, you know, he was watching her, her move? He was... He wouldn't... He would have had somebody help in he, order to have an alibi? Well, the thing about this is whoever... If someone was stalking her, looking for an opportunity to kill her, they didn't need to watch her moves because on this day she posted Everything. her entire route on social media. She announced where she was when she got there. She said at the beginning of the day she was going fishing. 
So if you were wanting to stalk Alicia, all you had to do was keep on the internet. You didn't even have to follow her around. So you, that may did, have been... Did, it, did they say that she had posted where she was going or... Yeah, she posted so, when she got there. So it's a possibility that, you know, they knew she was going to go there, so they could have got there ahead of her could and be. waited. Could be, or and just, or just uh, follow, you know, followed after a certain time, you know, been nearby, and then when she posts, she's there. Like, okay, I can go over there now. Um, but yeah, we we have to look at Tony. We know they were getting a divorce. Right. She told uh, Bethany that she had caught Tony in bed with another woman. Right. So, this is obviously not an amicable divorce from that point of view. It's it's, they're not both happy about the situation, but right. it sounds like from what we've been told and what we've been able to find out that they were that she had accepted the divorce and that they had discussed terms and it was going to be as clean a break as it could be at that point so right. Tony has we have to say an airtight alibi he was in Pierre South Dakota at the time that's been witnessed and verified by the police so we can't say that he was there that seems impossible but did he know about it, plan it, hire someone, you know, that, all that stuff? There's no evidence. And we have to, as with any murder, ask for the question of motive. If you've got, you've got your new woman, you're getting a divorce from your wife, uh, however unpleasant or unsavory it might be, uh, you're, you're clearly getting ready to move on with your life. Um, if you risk... Well, why would he kill her when he's, they had no children, so they can make a clean break, he never has to see her or talk to her again. Right. He can go off with new woman and live the life he's, he wants to leave, lead. Um, why? Why would you kill her? What is the reason? Did she have a huge life insurance policy and he's a beneficiary? Well, that could be a motive, but it would be really stupid because you know you're going to be the obvious suspect from the get-go. Mm -hmm. You're her husband. So it would be dumb, and no one's described Tony as stupid, to do something that obviously incriminating when you have a clear profit motive in mind. And it seem, seems unlikely that an underpaid Iowa teacher would have some kind of huge life insurance policy that he could benefit from. So I, I, for all those reasons, that doesn't seem like a motive. Again, statistically, you have to look at Tony, but as with everything in this case, uh, what's the motive? There's right. no evidence pointing to him. Now, could it be someone related or connected to Tony in some way? You know, hey, my buddy Tony's finally divorcing that horrible woman, and you know, maybe I can help him out so she doesn't, you know, claim alimony and take half of his money or whatever. Although they were both working, so it seems like money shouldn't have been a huge issue. It's not like one of them was wealthy and one of them wasn't, you know, the average working class kind of people. So that seems like a far-fetched idea to me too. So we're left with empty hands here looking at for a suspect and it's it's so frustrating, um, you know, that we have one secondhand account of the encounter that um, Alicia had with Tony's new woman, which I don't, I don't think we even got her name, it doesn't really matter at this point. So that's another possible suspect, but again, what motive would she have for getting rid of her new boyfriend, soon to be ex-wife? She's clearly won whatever contest there may have been. I think it's telling that, according to the story, again, this is second hand, uh, that Alicia told other people we don't have Tony's story because Tony has never communicated publicly about this. He's not part of the ongoing efforts to get justice for her. He has apparently made a clean break and moved on, and you can make of that what you will. But um, the one encounter that his, let's call her the new woman, had with Alicia Alicia walked in on them in bed, supposedly, and, you know, probably said something to the effect, you know, get the hell out of my bed, that's my husband. Right. And this woman wasn't embarrassed, apparently. No. Wasn't, Alicia didn't describe her as being embarrassed or ashamed or upset or 
what we were told said, is she didn't she, she didn't leave, she, she just sat there. She essentially stared Alicia down and right. Alicia's the person who left. That takes nerves of steel to me. Um, but that's my point of view. And again, we're getting this second hand right. from someone that Alicia told we don't have Tony's side of the story. So that's interesting, but I don't know that it necessarily points the finger any more strongly at Tony or that new woman. Right. Um, okay. Like everything else, it's possible, but we got no evidence to support it. So another frustrating loose end. It is things. All right. So I've provo you know I I've, I've come out with you know several theories that we've discussed and that the, maybe that, that you know that could be possible, but also highly unlikely depending yeah. on uh, how you look at it. Okay. Yeah. But if you were to take an educated mm -hmm. guess. What would you tell our audience? What possible theory could be the most likely according to what we have investigated? It's really hard to put all your chips on, on one number in this game. Um, and we, we still have to discuss Nick's story, the, right. the new information that we're bringing to the public for the first time. Um, and thank you again, Nick, for your courage in coming out. Um, I don't, the police looked at Nick as a suspect and given the circumstances that and he described those to us, that makes perfect sense, they should have looked at him. Um, and, but Nick had never met Alicia, she was a friend of his, his ex, um, who we don't have any reason, any motive for him or his ex to want to harm Alicia that we're aware of. We haven't found anything and clearly the police haven't either. Um, at least not enough that they've said anything publicly. Um, you know, it's you. The possibilities are, you know, a a crime of opportunity by a random deranged stranger who just hasn't done it before or since again, which is apparently the police's official stance on this, and they probably know more than we do, and they can't say anything. Um, the love makers. Um, uh, Tony or someone connected to him. Well, someone connected to Tony. We know Tony was in South Dakota. We have right. to take the police uh, saying that on faith. So someone connected to Tony. Um, <coughs> Nick. And none of those... None of those rate any higher in my mind than any of the others. I don't see... I don't see a motive for Nick or his ex, who I love to talk to. I don't see enough of a motive for the lovemakers. Anything is possible, but for two people to suddenly go to that extreme, assuming they've never killed anyone before, and they weren't, you know, some kind of Bonnie and Clyde out there, and have kept that secret since and hidden it from their respective families or partners or whatever, seems unlikely. Um, yeah, I... If I if you if I had to pick a direction, I would lean just because it's statistically the most likely towards someone connected to Tony. And again, he's never he's not a suspect. He's got an airtight alibi according to the police. So I'm not trying to to finger him in any way. But that seems the most likely scenario without any more information. I would, um, I would agree. To me. I feel the same. Um, and I think if Nick, <clears throat> another thing in Nick's defense, if if Nick, who you know, circumstantially he said he was fishing somewhere else alone, so he doesn't have a supported alibi for not being there, um, and there's other things that kind of help him fit what little information the cops got. Um, but my takeaway after talking with Nick was, you know, if Nick was involved in any way, why the hell would he talk to me now? Exactly. You know? Why would he talk to anybody? Because he's been getting away with it for five years. Exactly. So I don't lean towards Nick at all. It's such a tragedy. Yeah, it is. And um, we want to encourage everybody to seek out um, the um, 
Justice for Alicia Hummel page on Facebook. Uh, you can find it on our Facebook page. And uh, share this video or share the information. Keep Alicia's face and name out there. Um, we don't want to let this case go cold, for sure. Somebody out there knows something. And the sooner we can find that, the sooner Alicia's family can have justice. So we hope that what we've done has contributed to that in some small way, especially bringing Nick's story out and adding more information to the case. We want to thank everybody for joining us on our next episode. We hope to see you again soon. Have a good night. Thank you for watching.